Thank you, Lisa. Um, I visited Gettysburg as a child and was just appalled by the war and have never been a fan of war, which one um, But your book just gave a total different perspective. The fact that I visited Gettysburg about six years ago with my father um, all came alive what you wrote about. Uh, from Round Top to the cemetery, um, to the churches in the town. So, thank you. Now we move on to Robert Olmsted. Robert is the author of seven novels. Cold Black Horse, which we'll read from today, is a coming of age story of a young man during the Civil War. Um, this book has won the Hartman Prize for Fiction. The Ohio Atlanta Book Award uh, for Fiction in 2008. It was a number one book pick and a um, Borders original voice pick uh, the year it came out. Bob is a professor at Ohio Wesleyan University, and I present you Robert Olmsted. <laughs> a uh, short program like church. Mm -hmm. I'll have a <laughs> <coughs> I remember when I was a boy in church, I didn't want to check off and just It's really wonderful to be in a library. I grew up in a house that had, uh, I think it most maybe four books. Um, but we had a town library, a little one-room schoolhouse that had been converted. And every Saturday morning, my dad would take me to the library, and we would load up on books. And then every Sunday, my mother would take me to church, and I would be made to feel guilty for reading books. So it was wonderful. <laughs> my uh, my mom's still alive. My dad has since passed away. The library always remind me of him. I'd like to read this poem by James Dickey. Um, when I was a young man, James Dickey was the first writer who showed some interest in me, not because I had done anything in particular. The dusk of horses. Right under their noses, the green of the field is paling away because of something fallen from the sky. They see this and put down their long heads deeper in grass that only just escapes reflecting them as the dream of a mill pond would. The color green flees over the grass like an insect following the red sun over the next hill. The grass is white. There is no cloud so dark and white at once. There is no pool at dawn that deepens their faces and thirsts as this does. Now they are feeding on solid cloud, and one by one, with nails as silent as stars among the wood, hewed down years ago and now rotten, the stalls are put up around them. Now if they lean, they come on wood on any side. Not touching it, they sleep. 
no beast ever lived who understood what happened among the sun's fields or cared why the color of grass fled over the hill while he stumbled, led by the halter to sleep on his four taxed worthy legs. Each thinks he awakens where the sun is black on the rooftop, that the green is dancing in the next pasture and that the way to sleep in the cloud or in a risen lake is to walk as though he were still in the drained field, standing head down to pretend to sleep when led and thus to go under the ancient white of the meadow as green goes and whiteness comes up through his face holding stars and rotten rafters quiet, fragrant, and relieved. I mentioned my mom and dad. I think that I'm a combination of the two as a writer. Because of my mother, I believe in hell, but because of my father, I don't think anybody is there. <laughs> Cold Black Horse opens with a mother calling her son to the house. She has divined that Stonewall Jackson has been killed. She has no way of knowing this, but she knows something. And um, in her mind, this means that it's over. Um, his father was fighting in the valley she charges him with the responsibility of going out and bringing his father home. The evening of Sunday, May 10, in the year 1863, Hetty Childs called her son Roby to the house from the old fields where he walked the high meadow along the fence lines where the cattle grazed, licking shoots of new spring grass that grew in the mowing on the edge of the pasture. As he walked the fence lines out cold, silky spring evening, he let a hickory stick rattle along the silvered split rails. He was thinking about his father gone to war. As always, his father, always just a thought, a word, a gesture away. He spoke aloud to him in his absence, he asked him questions and made observations. He said good night to him before he fell asleep and good morning when he woke up. He thought it would not be strange to see him around a corner, sitting on a stool any time soon now. He'd been born on the mountain in the room where his mother and father conceived him, but it was his father who insisted he was not really a born baby, <clears throat> but a discovered baby, and was found swimming in the cistern, sleeping in the straw manger, squatting on an orange pumpkin behind the cowshed. Swarming the air about his head that evening, there was a cloud of newly hatched mayflies, ephemeral and chaffy, their pale members' wings cleaving the darkening sky. Not an hour ago, he'd watched them ascend in their moment like a host of angels from the stream that bubbled from a split rock and cooled before scribing a silver arc in the boulder-strewn pasture before falling over a cliff. And then he heard his mother's plaintive voice. When he came down from the high meadow, the dogs were standing sentry at her sides their solemn, stocky bodies leaning into her. She said softly, and then she said again with the conclusion of all time in her voice when he did not seem to understand, Thomas Jackson has died. It's over now, she said, looking, not looking at him, not favoring his eyes, but looking past him and someplace beyond. There was no emotion in her words, there was no sign for him to read that would reveal the particulars of her inner thoughts. Her face was the composure of one who 
who had experienced the irrevocable. He held his bony wrist. In his opposite hand, he shuffled his feet as if that gesture were a means to understanding. He patiently waited because he knew when she was ready, she would tell him what this meant. Thomas Jackson has been killed, she finally said. There's no sense in this continuing. She paused and sought words to fashion her thoughts. This was a mistake a long time ago, before we knew it, but a mistake nonetheless. Go and find your father and bring him back to his home. Her words were as if coming through time, and she was an old mother and the ancient woman. Where will I find him, he asked, unfolding his shoulders and setting his feet that he might stand erect. Travel south, she said, then east into the valley, and then north down the valley. She had sewed for him an up-buttoned, close-fitting linen shell jacket with the braids of a corporal and buttons made of sod and bleached chicken bones. She told him it was imperative that he leave the home place this very night and not to dally along the way, but to find his father as soon as he could and to surely find him by July. You must find him before July, she said. He was not to give up his horse under any circumstance whatsoever, and if confronted by any man, he was to say he was a courier, and he was to say it fast and to be in a hurry, and otherwise to stay hush and learn what he needed to know by listening, like he was doing right now. She then told him, there is a terror that men bring to the earth, to its water and air and its soil, and he would meet these men on his journey, and that his father was one of these men. And then she paused and studied a minute, and then she told him, without judgment, that someday he too might become one of these men. 